All right, folks, this is Abby Pearsall. It looks like we do have a quorum of the three members um, who were intending to come tonight. So we, we will proceed. Um, I will ask our chairman if you'd like me to do the read-in for public meetings first, and then I can turn it over to you. Oh, it looks like our chair is still connecting to audio, so we'll let him get set up. Hey, Joe, do you have sound? Joe Bunkley, do you have sound? John and Karen, while we're waiting for Joe to connect, do you have sound? Are you able to, to hear us? I can hear you. Okay. I can hear you. Okay, great. It looks like Joe just jumped off and he's gonna try to jump back on with, uh, with a different connection. Hey, Abby, can you hear me now? I can. You're good. <laughs> Boy, that was painful. All right. So I have, um, Joe, I have the read-in for the public meeting if you want me to go through with that. And then um, Don can officially call roll and we can turn it over to you. Would that work? That's fine. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. So folks, for, uh, for the record, this is a web-based call. So we're operating under the following <laughs> procedures. Uh, the session is being audio and video recorded. Please be advised today, we, uh, we, are, we are gonna be recording video too. Um, we will not be using the chat feature during this meeting. We won't be checking it. To ensure good sound quality, the default rule for this meeting is that everyone will remain on mute. Um, all the commissioners and staff will generally be on mute unless they're speaking or, this, or the commission is voting. Public comment will only be accepted during the public hearing portion of the meeting. The chair will announce when the hearing is open and will ask for those public comments. Um, and comments will not be accepted after the hearing is closed. If any member of the public creates an audio or video disruption, they could be manually ejected from the meeting on the recommendation of staff or the chair. When the hearing opens, you can give comments in the following manner. Use the raise hand feature in Zoom and wait to be called on. Or uh, before the hearing closes, the chair will ask for any new comments from people who are only able to join by phone or cannot use the raise hand feature. If multiple people uh, attempt to speak at once, staff will help to moderate. Please state your name and address for the record. And if multiple people wish to speak, the meeting moderator, in this case, staff will, will uh, help call on you individually and please listen for instructions. We appreciate your attendance at the meeting. And should you have any questions about the process, you can call our staff at 860-444-5813 after the meeting has ended um, and we can connect with you then. I'll have Don call roll and then we'll turn it over. Joe Bunkley. Here. John Bashaw. Here. Karen Barnett. Here. Greg Massett. Joe DeGuono. Tim Bleasdale. 
So there, there is a quorum to proceed with the meeting. All right, thank you. Uh, we will now call to order the meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission of the Town of Waterford on this day, September 28, 2020 at 6.30 p.m. Um, Karen, we will seat you for Greg Massive. Okay. Item number two, approval of the August 24, 2020 meeting minutes. I wasn't present for that meeting, so I don't think I can bring the motion. You can make the motion if you can't vote, I believe. Okay, well, uh, if that's the case, then I'll move approval of the minutes. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstaining. Karen and I. Thank you. Item number three, receipt of applications, PL 20-23. Request of Charles Hickey, applicant, Charles and Claudette Hickey owners for coastal site plan approval to construct a single, single family home on property located at 17 Division Street, R20 zone. As shown on plans titled CAM site plan, property of Charles Hickey, 17 Division Street, Waterford, Connecticut, dated July 30, 2020, revised uh, to 9 15 2020 and action is required by 12 1 2020. Uh, this application is in order for receipt and we will schedule the meeting for this one at a, the appropriate time. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> okay, item number four public hearings PL 20 17. Request of Eileen Dagatano, owner, Evan Dagatano, applicant for a two lots resubdivision and request for a waiver of section 5.3.8 uh, flag lots of the subdivision regulations for property located at 29 Huntsbrook Road, RU 120 zone, and as shown on plans titled resubdivision plan, boundary survey plan prepared by Eileen S. Dagatano. Public hearing must close by 11 1 2020. Okay, before we get started, this is uh, Mark Ray Debbie, the town planner. Um, before we get started, I'd like to point out to the commission that uh, this application also requests a waiver uh, from one of the sections of the subdivision regulation. Uh, in order for the commission to approve a waiver, it needs a vote of four members to approve the waiver. Uh, so what is being proposed here tonight, since we only have three members, you can still open a public hearing. You can still conduct the public hearing. And if you so choose, you can close. You just cannot act. Um, acting on the public hearing then would be um, uh, done on October 19th, which is our next regularly scheduled planning and zoning commission meeting date. Um, so I just would like to point that out to the commission uh, in terms of time, we can open the public hearing and conduct everything we need to do tonight. Um, and if it so chooses and close, this will not be able to act until the 19th when we have hopefully, and we're anticipating uh, at least four members of the board to vote. Uh, which means any of the members absent that uh, would want to vote would have to review the materials prior to that meeting, correct? That That's is, correct. yes, that is correct. That will all be available, including the recording here tonight. Uh, and then they would need to make a statement on the record on the 19th that they have reviewed the uh, materials and are uh, comfortable to vote. Okay, thank you. Are the exhibit list? Yes, so let me get started now with the exhibit list on this application. Uh, exhibit one, the application. Exhibit two, plan titled resubdivision plan boundary survey dated May 3rd, 2020, revised through August 2nd, 2020. Exhibit three, the letter dated August 3rd, 2020 from Brian Flores, Flores Survey, requesting a waiver of section 5.3.8 of the subdivision regulations. Exhibit four, statement of use dated August 3rd, 2020, prepared by Brian Flores. Exhibit five, drainage impact assessment dated July 29th, 2020. Exhibit six, report of the Conservation Commission action dated August 20th, 2020. Exhibit seven, 
Notice of public hearing advertised in the day newspaper on September 14, 2020 and September 21st, 2020. Exhibit 8, notification letter to applicant dated September 8, 2020. Exhibit 9, certificate of mailing received 9-17-2020. Exhibit 10, plan titled compilation plan. Plan prepared for Stephen O. on your part, 19 and 23, Huntsbrook Road, date revised September 17, 2020. And exhibit 11, the staff report, dated September 18, 2020. Okay. All right, thank you, Mark. <clears throat> uh, do we have the applicant on the call? So oh, this is Brian Florek, Florek Surveying LLC, uh, representing Evan Digatano, the applicant for this project. Um, uh oh, boy, that, that weirded me out. Sharing the screen. Thank you. <laughs> I was like, what did I do? I didn't, I didn't touch anything. <laughs> Everything's blowing up on me. <laughs> so Evan's uh, mother owns this property. Evan is trying to develop what would be a, a flag lot uh, on, on this property. The issue here is the RU120 zone. The RU120 zone with the frontage just this property doesn't have the amount of frontage necessary to, to create two regular building lots, which is, I believe, the intent of the flag lot regulation. Uh, it has the width. Um, we needed to pick up uh, 26,000 square feet from Anya Parrick uh, to the rear to make the, the acreage the, meet the RU120 zone. Um, it, the intention is to purchase this property upon approval. Um, basically, the, the, the major issue here is the frontage and, and we were able to, and it's an interesting configuration, uh, but this pro property does fit the RU120 zone with the acreage. Um, We did get a wetlands commission uh, permit uh, last month. Uh, everything else is pretty much straightforward. Every, we meet the minimum requirements, minimum square, uh, buildable area, uh, area. It's just the frontage is what, what gets us. So that's uh, kind of in a nutshell pitch. Um, I would be happy to, if anybody else had any other um, thing that they want to add, Dave or, or, or Evan. Um, that's kind of where where I where I'm going to leave it. All right, thank you, Brian. Any of the commissioners have any comments or questions at this time? This is John Bashaw. Just a, a question about the additional parcel that's being acquired. Is are the um, is that going to be consolidated into one parcel at some point in time? So that, that piece is going to be split between Eileen or lot one and lot two. Uh, and both, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Brian. Uh, the, the purpose of that would be uh, is the, the area for both lots to, to make the 120. Um, okay, but so the additional piece that's gonna be added to each of those lots, will that piece that the added piece be uh, included into the lots that are part of this proposal? Yes. Okay. That's correct. All right. So for, purchase the property, Brian, to the existing lot and then subdivide into two. Correct. Okay. I have Any a question. Other? Go ahead, Karen. Um, this is Karen. I was looking at the um, zoning requirements table in the town of Waterford PZC form one. And I noticed that on the, I think it's lot two, um, the front yard uh, the required is 50 feet. And on one of the houses, it's only gonna be 40 feet. Is that due to topography or, um, because the backyards have plenty of room. I'm just curious why they cited the building. Uh, that's an existing non-conforming structure, Karen. Okay, okay. Yeah, that, that house is existing. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah, no problem. Lines here. Okay, um, if there are no other <clears throat> questions or comments from the commission, um, I guess we can open up the public hearing now, is that correct? Okay, we'll now open up the public hearing on PL-20-17. Is there anyone who would like to speak for or against this applicant? I say for the second time, is there anybody who would like to speak for or against this applicant? Third and last time, is there anyone who would like to speak for or against this applicant? All right, hearing none, uh, we have to keep this public hearing open, Mark, uh, Abby? No. Um, our continuation of? And no, everything has been, has been entered into the exhibits, including my staff report, okay. um, is already in. So if you so desire, you can close the public hearing and then leave the rest up for discussion. I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. Okay. Um, the uh, second public hearing that we have this evening, uh, PL-20-2022. Is that a Mr. No, there's actually so there's two applications associated with um, this public hearing, and Mark okay. will go through that a little in, in greater detail in the staff report review. But there are the two applications. There is one to change the zone of 384 and 984 Willis Avenue, and one and a separate application to modify standards. Um, of the of section 15.3 of the zoning regulations. So right. information will be presented together, but any any potential action taken um, would be done separately. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, request of SIGCON Associates LLC applicant, Home Theater TV and Douglas V. Wyzarek. I hope I didn't brutalize that too bad. Uh, owners to change the zone for properties located at 384 and 394 Willis Avenue. Extension for CG General Commercial to CMF Commercial Multifamily. Applicant is also requesting to amend section 16.3 of the zoning regulations minimum lot frontage and width to reduce the minimum required frontage from 250 feet to 150 feet in sections 18.3.8 maximum building height to remove the requirement for an elevator in buildings of more than three stories. Public hearing must close by 11-1-2020. Okay, the exhibit list for this application, exhibit one, the application, exhibit two, planning and zoning application supplement, exhibit three, property and topographic survey of numbers 384 and 394 Willis Avenue extension dated August 2nd, 2020. Exhibit four, proposed zone change plan dated August 28th, 2020. Exhibit five, National Diversity Database Map, June 2020. Exhibit six, Notice of Public Hearing Advertised in the Day Newspaper on September 16, 2020 and September 21st, 2020. Exhibit seven, Notification Letter to the Applicant dated September 15, 2020. Exhibit eight, Certified Copy of the Zoning Regulations, effective date, September 9th, 2020. Exhibit nine, pages of policy guide, effective January 1st, 2012. Exhibit 10, certificates of a butter mailing, received September 18th, 2020. Exhibit 11, application supplement, revised to September 21st, 2020. Exhibit 12, staff report, dated September 28th, 2020. Exhibit 13, letter received from Waterford Ambulance Service. Exhibit 14, email correspondence from Bruce Grant, 390 Willis Avenue Extension. Exhibit 15, architectural renderings of proposed buildings. That's it for the exhibit list. Thank you, Mark. 
Uh, do we have a representative for the applicant here tonight? We do. Uh, for the record, my name is Brandon Hanfield, a professional engineer licensed in the state of Connecticut uh, with the Antique River Consultants LLC. Uh, also with me here on the uh, meeting listening in is Kevin Daly, the applicant with SIGCON Associates. Uh, I'll give a brief presentation of our of the requested amendments. The first, I'll present the zoning map amendment, and then we'll move on to the requested amendments to the zoning regulations. Uh, if there's any questions, don't hesitate, hesitate to uh, chime in. Um, let's see. Granny, uh, excuse me, Granny, can I just interject here for a second? Sure. In terms of procedure, what we'll be doing is um, holding the hearing for both the regulation amendment and the map amendment, and then um, acting separately on, on the regulation amendment and then separately on the map amendment as well. So I just kind of wanted, wanted to point that out first before we get going. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, would you mind going two pages up to the existing survey and overlay? Perfect, one more. Okay. Uh, just to give a general orientation of where we are, uh, this is the existing condition survey prepared in 2020, overlaid on the 2019 aerial. Um, it's due to the size of the property, it's on two pages. So what we're looking at is sheet one, which is the north half of the property. Um, and uh, outlined in orange are the two subject parcels. So 394 Willits Avenue is the larger parcel to the west. And 384 is the 0 0.048 acre parcel to the uh, northeast. And altogether, uh, those lots make up about 26.6 total acres. Uh, to the north or left on your sheet is Willits Avenue extension. Uh, moving down uh, to the northwest, you'll see the intersection with Boston Post Road. Uh, that ranges from 300 to 600 feet away from our property. Uh, what you don't see on the map, but further out to the east or up is the city of New London, about 2,000 feet away. And uh, to the south, which we don't need to see on this sheet, but is, is the railroad um, property. Um, the existing conditions, as you see here, again, outlined in orange, 26.6 acres. Uh, the current zone, as described in the application materials, is general commercial district. Um, as you can see by the early overlay, the, our subject property is undeveloped or currently under, undeveloped, except for a very small outbuilding on the 384 Willits Avenue parcel. Um, and surrounding our development, which is undeveloped, is generally a mix of commercial uses that are focused around Willits Avenue extension and Boston Post Road. Um, so you can see uh, below our property or to the west, you'll see uh, Careco, City Tire, Napa, um, and Restore property, which is the large black building just to or below our property. Um, a gas station and bank are to the north across Willits Avenue. Uh, Atlantic Broadband property is above or to the east. And then mainly we have some residential properties that are to the southeast and southwest, uh, including um, the recently completed uh, Waterford Park multi-family property, which just touches the east corner. Uh, if you want to move on to the slide three. <coughs> so on this map here, we, we included all the zone change information for the commission. Uh, highlighted in green are the subject plot parcels. Um, and the cross hatch would be the smaller 384, the, the hatch would be 394. Again, Willis Avenue extension to the left or north. Uh, and all parcels that are within 500 feet are highlighted in a yellow or a pale tan. Um, and those abutters were notified um, by certificate of mailing. Uh, the existing zone lines are in the bold black with the zone lines labeled. And uh, to keep things simple, in summary, we're requesting a change of the existing zone, so two properties in green, from general commercial CG to uh, multifamily residential district C-MF. Uh, and in short, that would maintain the existing allowed or permitted, especially permitted uses uh, for the general commercial district while 
also allowing a multifamily use in accordance with uh, section 18. Um, that is the, the short uh, description. Um, as detailed or in, in our application narrative, there are a number of items we checked off from your 2012 plan of preservation, conservation and development. Um, I can go through those in detail, but for now I'll, I'll kind of highlight the bullets uh, up front. We do believe it meets that POCD. And um, for those reasons, the site is located within a potential area for development for mixed use. Um, the site is also identified for possible future mixed use node on a community structure map in that POCD. Um, the site uh, will meet your definition for mixed use in that document. Uh, it's also located within an existing mixed use area. Um, we feel the multifamily uh, potential will strengthen and, and uh, direct development towards existing developed areas. Uh, as we show, showed on the 2019 area overlay, there is a good mix of development, including commercial and residential in this area. Um, it will add residential uses and diversity of those residential uses to this area. They will have single family, multifamily and other residential uses. And there are um, a variety of transportation choices, uh, mainly for this development will be an interconnection with the um, public sidewalk system along Willis Avenue, which uh, can get you down to Boston Post Road and your existing network of businesses. Um, in addition to the plan of preservation, conservation, and development, we also believe the application meets your town of water for zoning regulations and Connecticut general statutes as uh, described in your staff report. I don't remember the exhibit number, but um, Mark did a great job uh, summarizing those. Um, I can move on to the regulation amendment, or if you want to have questions now on the zone change, I don't know how you'd like to do it. Uh, I'll take your advice on that. Uh, why don't you continue on, and then if we have any questions, we'll uh, we'll get it at the end. Very good. Uh, moving on to our proposed amendments to the regulations, uh, our first request was uh, amending section sixteen point three, uh, which is your minimum lot frontage and width. Um, so the existing text uh, that we summarize in our application is no lot used for multifamily development, and any multifamily district shall have less than two hundred fifty feet of frontage in a public street. Uh, we are proposing to amend that text uh, to strike 250 feet and make it 150 feet. Uh, the reason that we provide is also described and, and mainly we feel that the 150 feet requirement will still provide adequate access to a public street um, as defined in section one of the regulations. Um, for drilling down further, we also believe that uh, the multifamily use, which is can be comparable to the commercial uses that are currently allowed in the CG zone. Um, CG zone has a minimum project requirement of 125 feet and a minimum lot width of 150 feet. Uh, proposing for the multifamily to go to 150 feet is comparable to that uh, general commercial use. Uh, the access driveways can be comparable or often smaller. Uh, the traffic impact is often comparable or less. Um, so we feel it's a good comparison uh, for that GC or CG current zone. And um, we feel the multifamily uh, frontage requirement would be uh, suitable at 150 feet. Um, it also will still allow, even in um, appreciation of the additional side yard setbacks that you'll find in the multifamily district, uh, you'll still have an adequate swath of land left with 150 feet uh, if you were to sub subtract out the two uh, 50 foot side doors. Uh, the last request or amendment is um, section 18.3.8 uh, with regards to the maximum building height of multifamily buildings. Uh, the existing text is, uh, I'll read the whole thing. Uh, maximum height of any building in a multifamily development shall not exceed 40 feet except that in the CMF district, the commission may approve one additional foot of building height for each one foot of provided A, additional separation distance between buildings over the 30 feet required by the section, and B, additional setback distance from abutting residential zone property beyond the setback distance is required by section 18.3.4. Uh, 
in no event shall the building height exceed 55 feet or four stories. Uh, the last sentence here is any building of more than three stories shall have an elevator serving all floors. Um, we are proposing to amend that paragraph to delete the last sentence. Um, so we would like to delete or request that the last sentence, any building of more than three stories shall have an elevator serving all floors. Uh, the reason for that is not because we're proposing to build a building with four stories that uh, won't have an elevator. It's really to defer to the existing International Building Code and Connecticut State Building Code in their interpretation of story and requirements for accessibility in elevators. And um, I did email um, information from an architect, John A. Wicko, a project architect, uh, who reviewed the existing codes and, and agreed that um, what we have here is topography that allows for the buildings to be stepped into grade. And so um, what you have here is, is basically a front elevation on the bottom and a side elevation on the top. Um, that side elevation shows the building being built into a grade. So above the red line would be your standard uh, multifamily residential apartment building that would have three stories or two flights of stairs maximum serving all floors. Uh, in the case of building an integrade, we are able to provide a basement um, and the building code does a very thorough job of defining what a basement is and what a story is. And in this case, within a basement, which means more than 50% of the building is below grade, um, and then there's some height restrictions in there as well, we're able to put a few units in the, in the quote unquote walkout portion of the building. Those units are uh, access independent from the upper units. Um, they have at grade access to a lower parking area and sidewalks. Um, each of those units is handicapped accessible and there is no increase in the number of stairs or technically stories with this type of building. Um, so what we're looking for is the current description or current definition of a story in the building code to be used. Um, rather than the current zoning state uh, sentence, which I don't believe there is a definition of story in the zoning regulation. So we just want to be sure it's quite clear that we want to meet all applicable codes and want to be clear about it. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, John and Karen, do you have any uh, questions or comments? This is John. Um, I don't have any questions regarding the zone change. I just have a general question about the zoning, the amendment related to the frontage. So, so the request here, as I understand it, is for this, this zone now, these zones, wherever they might exist in the town, we're going to reduce that 250 foot uh, frontage requirement to 150 feet when that particular use is multi-family, correct? Correct. And do, how many uh, zones in in this in the town are would be impacted by this, Abby or Mark? So there's there's generally two areas in town. Um, the area between Stone Heights and Allen Ward that encompasses the Jordan uh, Plaza and that that whole stretch there, and then up um, at the end of Cross Road across the street for that property that goes up the hill for which there was uh, original amendments made to the district. That's really the only other places um, that that are there. The reduction in frontage requirements wouldn't make any lots more non-conforming if it is already non-conforming um, and so it wouldn't it wouldn't have an impact necessarily in the ability of vacant properties to develop or properties to be packaged in a way that would would make them possible to redevelop and, and if maybe if somebody could provide me the rationale for the, for the 250 feet that otherwise would exist for the multifamily uh, unit Good question. <laughs> um, quite honestly, I don't know. Um, uh, I don't. I don't know what the reasoning was to make it 250. Uh, I recall, at least if I've been here, it's always been 250. 
So I'm not aware of any changes that have been made prior, prior to this. And, and usually those, lo those longer frontages are designed to provide um, space between other uses and to limit the overall number of parcels that can um, effectively meet the requirements to actually be developed in a multifamily manner. So there is that potential, um, but it's, it's, you know, again, we could go, I, we didn't do um, the research to look at the record of reasoning why for that, that particular issue. Right. And as far as, as to the extent that it would apply to sight lines, that would all be part of the actual application process for the facility itself, where there'd have to be the traffic study and the review of, of uh, whether the access and ingress to the facility is has adequate uh, sight lines and is safe, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, and the only question I have, and I think it was answered by the app applicant with respect to the elevator, really what we're doing here is deferring the requirement for the elevator to the building and fire applicable building and fire codes instead of having it encompassed within zoning. Correct, yes. Okay. And the question I have for, I guess, for Mark and Abby to the extent that they can answer it is, are you guys you know, satisfied that indeed, you know, the, the building code and fire code does, I guess you really can't opine as to whether it adequately addresses, you know, issues such as this, but that's really what we're doing is we're really punting it over to building the building code and the fire code. And I want to make sure that we're, we feel comfortable that the, that those codes can adequately address this particular issue. So generally speaking, matters related to the construction and the accessibility interior to the building are typically handled through building and fire codes. Um, I think that when the modification was made in 2018 to include this language, it was meant in, in some parts, I think, to um, address any potential concern the commission may have had relative to elevators and buildings, if that's mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. Um, I, I would I would say, and, and it can certainly come up during the public hearing portion of, of this, of the public hearing or the public comment portion, um, there was a letter received from the Ambulance Association that, you know, noted some concern with this based on experiences in other buildings around town. However, the, the fundamentals is even if the zoning regulations were to have um, this language remain, fundamentally building and fire code will govern what, what, what should be going into those buildings. And so it's, it's not typical that the interior requirements would be handled through zoning. Okay. And if I, if I could help answer that question, Mark, I don't know if you received the submission, it was a little late, but we did get a letter from John A. Wickle architect um, that goes through the international building code sections. Uh, it's a little difficult to, um, to print it and hold it up, or I don't know if you can share a screen, I could, I could show it to you. Um, but in, in general, he goes through the parts of the building code that we have to meet with regards to accessibility and the definition of a basement and the definition of a story. And, and that's what he wanted to be very clear that these will be three story buildings by definition in the International Building Code. Um, the basement is not considered a story uh, because it has separate access and is more than 50% below grade. And that's, uh, that's what he goes through. And that's, that's what we're trying to implement here is we are providing a three-story building, but by definition in the building code, um, the lack of definition in the zoning regulations was where we weren't sure about clarification. And uh, Brandon, I, that report, which I don't have, does it conclude that with respect to this particular building as you presented it here today, I understand this is not the formal application for the building itself, but as presented with the three story structure in the basement, that an elevator would not be required under the building code for this particular piece. That's correct. An elevator would not be required in this type of building. Uh, and we also had informal conversation with the fire marshal about this building and, and there was an agreement that as long as the uh, fire code is followed, which in this case, uh, again, wouldn't, wouldn't have an elevator or additional requirements for access, uh, we'd be good to go. If it didn't meet the building or fire code, I am sure they will um, comment on that and make sure we do. 
Uh, Brandon, is this you're referring to that letter from the architect? Uh, we had not received that in here. Can you submit that as an exhibit for the record, please? Sure. You want me to read the whole thing just so you have it? And if you'd like, Brandon, I can, if you can, if you can easily share, share your screen, I can make you the host and then you can turn it back to me. It's up sure, to you. I can, I can do that very easily. Okay. All right. You're hosting. I am hosting. I'm going to share the correct screen. This is uh, number three. Is everybody able to see a letter from John A. Wickle, Architect, LLC? Yeah. Okay. Right. Great. Um, would you like me to read it into the record? Sure, go ahead. Okay. December 28, 2020, Planning Commission, Town of Waterford, regarding accessibility, Willits Avenue, Waterford, Connecticut, DB Construction, R2 Multifamily. Dear Commissioners, allow me to fully explain the handicapped access for the three-story buildings and the three-story building with a walkout basement, not a fourth story, as defined by the 2015 IBC and 2018 CSBC. Each building has accessible entrance at the grade level floors with stair access to the upper two floors, providing an accessible route from the site into the building. Quote, or, uh, open 2015 IBC 1104.2. Uh, the grade level floors are provided with handicapped accessible dwelling units that satisfy the overall unit requirements, level types, and unit count percentage of accessibility. 2015 IBC 1107.6.2. Uh, one of the three-story buildings, 2015 IBC section T504.4, has a walkout basement that is occupied by four handicapped units with individual single entrances slash exits. Meeting spaces with a single exit, 2015 IBC T1006.2.1. The building is more than 50% underground with the average grade as defined by chapter two definitions of the 2015 IBC for a basement level. We have designed a three-story building that meets all egress and accessibility requirements by having all floors that can be accessible designed to have accessible access. Elevator is not required for the 2015 IBC section 1009.2.1 as it is not four or more stories above or below the level of exit discharge. Respectfully, John A. Wicko. And I will hand it back to you unless you'd like to keep it up. All right, thank you for that. I have, um, I have a couple of questions if you don't mind. For Abby, um, V and Mark, the, um, Apartments, multifamily that we have in the old um, theater property on Boston Post Road. That's multifamily, right? That's correct, yes. They have 250 feet? Frontage? I they do. I believe they do. The thing about now, you, you're talking stone heights? No. Some of Victoria Garden is driving. The drive in. Oh, 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 that's the drive-in property right across from the Dunkin' Donuts. Not, the drive-in is not multifamily. It's that, not. That's an assisted living facility. Okay, thank you. Um, the other question I have in regards to the um, elevators, and I see where the letter states that it's not required, um, but looking at your uh, architectural design there, it showed the handicap access. And I find it kind of ironic that we have handicap access doors, but we don't have handicap access to the second and third floors uh, other than stairs. Um, so how should a handicapped individual want to reside on the second and third floors? How would they do it? It's a good question. I, I can give you my... Um experience with this type of building is that any unit with grade access has to be handicap accessible uh, and grade access means a door directly to an accessible route to the parking or site. So you'll see that um, if this were a three-story building, all of the first floor units would have handicap accessibility with the addition, addition of the basement since those have grade access or access to grade with an accessible route to parking. Those are also accessible. Um, 
for R2 construction, you're not required to provide all accessible units. It's just the ones that are at or had grade level access. Um, and, and that's my understanding how it's, it's written for this style of building. Um, once you go over three stories and an elevator is required, I believe all units have to be accessible because okay. they have an elevator. Okay. All right, thank you. Any other questions uh, from the commission? Okay, with that said, um, we can open up the public hearing. <clears throat> Is there anybody who would like to speak for or against uh, this application? I say for a second time, is there anyone who would like to speak for or against this application? And third and last time, is there anybody who would like to speak for or against this application? That being said, we can entertain a motion to close the public hearing. I'll move, uh, make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, item five application review request of Eileen uh, Digatano, owner Evan Digatano, applicant for a two lot sub resubdivision and request for a waiver of section. 5.3.8 flag lots uh, of the subdivision regulations for property located at 29 Huntsworth Road, RU120 zone, and as shown on plans titled Resubdivision Plan Boundary Survey Plan prepared by Eileen S. Digatano. Yeah, this application um, will be reviewed at the next scheduled planning and zoning commission meeting, October 19th. Correct. All right. Thank you very much. All right, we'll move on to the uh, PL 20-20 uh, and 20-22. <clears throat> Request of SIGCON Associates, LLC, Applicant Home Theater TV and Douglas uh, Z. Wysorek, owners to change the zone for properties located at 384 and 394 uh, Willis Avenue. Extension for CG to CMF, Applicant is also requesting to amend section 16.3 of the zoning regulations, minimum lot frontage and width to reduce the minimum required frontage from 250 feet to 150 feet and section 18.3.8 maximum building height to remove the requirement for an elevator in buildings of more than three stories. <coughs> Discussion. Are we taking up just the uh, first, the PL 2020 application? Uh, yeah, this would be the, um, we can discuss and so act on the zoning map amendment first and then the regulations after. Okay. I have no additional comments. Okay, um, Karen? Um, I don't think so, John kind of covered it. Okay, um, are we satisfied with the staff review, um, executive summary on uh, zoning map amendment for PL 2020? I am. Okay, um, and we can entertain a motion if you like. All right, and I'll, I'll um, propose, a, I'll make a motion that um, based upon the information provided by the applicant uh, in this public hearing that uh, we make the following findings that the application PL 2020 meets the requirements of section 28 of the Waterford zoning regulations. Uh, in addition, second finding that application PL 2020 meets the requirements of Connecticut general statutes chapter 124 section 8-3 governing changes of zoning regulations and districts. And third, that the proposed zone map amendment 
uh, is consistent with the 2012 Plan of Preservation, Conservation and Development. Uh, in particular, it provides uh, for mixed use development within an area that's identified as a future mixed use node. And it contains adequate infrastructure to support the use. And that we approve the application PL 20-20 to change the zone designation for properties located at 384 and 394 Willis Avenue extension from the CG zone to the CMF commercial multifamily and that we adopt uh, the findings which I just set forth herein in my, my motion uh, findings one two three of the staff report. Okay I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay so moved. Hey, before we go to the next one, uh, we can establish an effective date for this one as well. Um, I have October 21st, 2020 for an effective date. All right, so we need a motion for that, right? Yes. I'll, so I'll make that motion. Uh, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. Okay, we'll now move to the uh, zoning regula regulation amendment, PL-20-22, part of the uh, application. Um, once again, the staff review has um, our recommended action and some findings. Is everybody uh, okay with that or do they need any uh, further explanation? I, this is John, I think the staff review along with the comments and answers that staff has provided and that the applicant has provided to questions in this public hearing. Uh, and in addition, the uh, architect's letter that was just added as an exhibit, I forget the exhibit number, but it was just added as an exhibit. Um, I find those to be adequate. Thank you, John. Okay, we can entertain a motion on this one as well. All right, um, so again, based upon the information that's been provided in this public hearing uh, and including the, the uh, answers to questions from the staff provided, uh, I'm sorry, uh, answers to questions posed by the commissioners uh, provided by this, uh, the answers provided by staff and by the applicant, uh, I uh, make a motion that the commission find that application PL 20-22 meets the requirements of section 28 of the Waterford zoning regulations that uh, application PL 20-22 meets the requirements of Connecticut General Statutes 124, chapter 124, section 8-3, governing changes of zoning regulations and districts. And that the proposed regulation amendments uh, as provided by the applicant, um, and I guess I wanna be specific as set forth in the application itself, there was a proposed language and how to modify those sections, that they are consistent with the 2012 Plan of Preservation, Conservation and Development, in that the modifications proposed will provide for additional opportunities for multifamily development and in contributing to a more diverse housing portfolio in the town of Waterford. Uh, and further, I uh, make a motion to approve application PL 20-22 to amend the zoning regulations section 16.3 reducing the minimum frontage requirement from 250 feet to 150 feet and to amend section 18.3.8, removing the requirement to have an elevator for buildings of more than three stories uh, based upon the representation that such requirements will be governed by the uh, applicable building and fire codes and that we adopt the findings one through three of the staff report. Thank you, John. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. And Brandon, if you're jumping off, if you could just make me host again before you leave, that would be helpful. <laughs> I was wondering how to do that. And um... hover over my name, and there should be a little button that says more with an arrow. Or you can hover over the picture and there should be three little dots in the upper right hand corner and i am the host now thank you uh thank you so much and i appreciate all your time thank you okay you're welcome we'll need a um a motion for the effect establishing the effective date on the regulation amendment 
So would that be the same date there, Mark? Yeah, October 21st, that's correct. All right, I'll make that motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye, so moved. Thank you, thank you, Mark. <clears> hey, <throat> okay, item six, correspondence. We have none. Item number seven, administrative review. One one quick item to bring up um, for this, and, and we'll discuss it further when the when the whole commission is available on October nineteenth. We've contemplated as staff um, looking at the opportunity to move the commission meeting nights from Mondays to Tuesdays. A um, couple of reasons for this, and when we're doing an analysis right now of how many other boards and commissions meet on those nights, and how both um, how physical availability of rooms will play out once we're allowed to meet in person. Um, but one of the things that we do run into consistently every year is conflicts with Monday holidays. Um, you know, we're meeting tonight on Yom Kippur, which is not anybody's ideal situation. Um, and then also once we get into to budget hearing times, we tend to have conflicts um, with the board of finance meetings and we are always kind of shifting rooms and those types of things. And then also um, working around RTM meetings in terms of scheduling our meetings. So we've thought about um, considering a Tuesday night meeting. And so we, would, we were just asking folks to maybe think about that, um, whether it would fit into your schedules. If you have longstanding commitments on Tuesdays, we'll, we'll ask the members who are not present to think about it as well. Um, and we can have a discussion when we set the schedule for uh, the, the, next, uh, the next calendar year. So just something to think about. Yeah, no, that's that. Uh, that's good, Abby. I'm I'm fine with that. And then the first <laughs> couple of meetings in October, we'll try it out. <laughs> yeah, that that would work for me. Karen, do you have any comments? I think that actually would be better, to be honest. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, because then when the you know people go away for a long weekend or something like that, uh, you know, we don't have to worry about attending. Yeah, and they may give applicants a little bit more time to, to get stuff to us right before the meeting if they're getting last minute comments in too. So that could help as well. Okay, sounds good. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, item number eight, adjournment. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have, Have a good night. Night, everybody. Have Bye -bye. a good night. John, Bye. clean shaven. Yeah, that's true. <laughs>